Hello, everyone. Welcome to a talk about formalizing category theory in EGDA. To begin with, in general, why do we care about formalizing category theory in proof assistance? Well, one obvious reason is to study category theory itself. Another reason is to study the proof assistant. Some others might want to apply the formalized category theory to the study of other related fields. For these reasons, many have attempted to formalize category theory in various systems, including EGDA, Koch, Isabel, Lean, and Idris. In EGDA, there was a previous library, and most development effort is spent on multiple Koch libraries. Here is a summary table of some previous work. As you can see, many systems are involved here, and indeed, many libraries are in Koch. In terms of scales in lines of code, many libraries are under 15,000 lines of code, while some are fairly big. For example, this one in Koch, using homotopy type theory, and this one in Isabel, they are close to 100,000 lines of code. Given a previous library existing in ACTA, why do we implement yet another one? A good reason is that the previous library stopped working in ACTA 2.5.2. And what's worse, it used some additional constructs like stratus XMK, irrelevance, and even some postulates. In our library, we want to improve the previous library overall by adapting it to the latest ACTA 2.6 or up, limiting ourselves to Martinov type theory, reworking the module layout such that it's more user-friendly, connecting it with the standard library more tightly. We also want to provide some properties instead of just a bunch of definitions. Currently, the library has around 27,000 lines of code. It had around 24,000 lines of code at time of submission so it has a pretty decent growth rate. Other than us, there are 10 contributors to the, more than 10 contributors to the library. And compared to 12,000 lines of code in the previous library, we more than twice the size. The library has lots of setoid based elementary category. By setoid, we mean a, each category carries its own equivalence relation between morphisms. We'll discuss it later. The category has most of basic definitions we would expect from a category theory library and many lemmas and theorems. It also has a decent amount of enriched and higher category theory. Just to name a few things we have in the library. We have the following concepts like category, functor, mental transformation, adjoint functors, different kinds of monoidal categories, condition close category, comma category, initial and terminal objects, products, co-products, ends, co-ends, et cetera. We have many constructions like the category of categories, the category of setoids, the category of, of pre-sheaves, the category of monoidal categories. We also proved many properties. The classical ones include the unit lemma, adjoint functor theorem, Lambex lemma, right adjoints preserved limit, local condition closure and condition closure of setoids, etc. And this list is not exhaustive. In order to make our library as general as possible, we employed the following design principles, home setoids, universe polymorphism, definitional duality, records for encapsulation, predicate versus structure. Let's look into e each of them. We use setoids to model home sets. This allows us to follow the standard library and is compatible with K turned on, which is what this option for, and typical actor, which is what, which is what this option for. We use universe polymorphism to allow concept reuse across different universe levels. We have one small problem here, that is actor is non-cumulative. While it has a cumulative it has a, an experimental cumulativity out flag, but when we used it in our library, we discovered bugs in the universe level solver, so it didn't work out quite well. Here is a partial 
definition of a category in our library. This definition is indexed by three universe levels. O is the level for objects. L is the level for morphisms. E is the level for this binary re relation between morphisms. Equive is a field carrying a proof of this binary relation actually being an equivalence relation. And these two combines make our definition setoid based. In category theory, duality is a convenient principle. It says that proving one theorem gets another one for free. So proof one gets two. In formalization, to make this principle applicable, we want duality to hold definitionally. For example, we want the opposite of the opposite of a category C and C to be definitionally equal. This ensures the dual property of in the opposite of C to hold in C without any extra work. We also want to relate the product in the opposite of C and the co-product in C definitionally. To achieve this goal, sometimes additional laws might be necessary. In our definition of a category, we require the law of associativity of composition, which is expressed by this SOC field. Unfortunately, this law alone is, is not quite duality friendly. To change that, we require another symmetrized version of associativity, sim SOC, which just flips a SOC which by making the moving the expression on the right hand side to the left and the one on the left hand side to the right. It turns out that would be enough to ensure the opposite of the opposite of C and C to be definitionally equal. Other than category, many other concepts like monad and natural transformation require similar additional laws. Since this idea is very helpful, we want to push it to all concepts. To ensure everything is duality friendly, we introduce some redundancy to the definition, to the definitions by requiring dual concepts to be defined individually. For example, products and co-products are separate definitions and monads and co-monads are also separate definitions. As a first step to ensure definitional duality, we define, we define conversions between dual concepts in module ending with duality. For each conversion, we provide a proof of definitional duality. In this example, we show that converting a monad, a co-monad given as M here, to a monad in the opposite category and back is the same as the co-monad that we begin with. This is ensured by, by making sure the body of this theorem is the reflexivity proof so that both sides of this equality, they are convertible and therefore achieving definitional duality. Another principle is that we use records to encapsulate concepts. This principle plays well due to the feature of record modules in ACTA. Consider this partial definition of a monad in a category C. Among other things, we require a, a, a functor F and a natural transformation eta in, in it. Given a monad M, normally to access deeper fields, we have this kind of nested cause of accessors. The first expression is trying to access the object mapping of F of M. The second expression is trying to get the morphism mapping of F of M. And the third one is trying to get the, the neutrality square of eta of M and applying that to F. As you can see, these expressions are very long and verbose, not quite readable and take a while to understand. To fix this problem, we add two additional module declarations to the definition of a monad. After that, now we have two Fs and two Etas in the definition of a monad. The first F means 
the functor itself, while the second f is a module containing the fun the fun f as a functor. Since they live in two different namespaces, Ekta is not going to get confused. And the same goes for these two etas. Let's come back to this, to this problem here again. Given M, we can declare another module M. And by declaring that, we can simply use dot accessor to get the nested fields. So even if one doesn't really know much about our library, it should be quite obvious that the first expression is trying to get the object mapping of f of m. And the second one is trying to get the morphism mapping of m of f of m. And the last one is trying to get a, uh, the naturality square of eta of m applying that to f. So another important design principle is how to organize concepts. There are typically two styles, predicate versus structure. Intuitively, the predicate style expresses an is a relation and the structure style expresses a has a relation. This choice could be fundamental in, sys in systems with automated search mechanism like COC because it drastically impacts the efficiency of the chosen automated search mechanism. But in our library, we, we don't really use any automation so this problem is still important, but not quite as much. It, it becomes more about usability and namespaces. In many systems, we are forced to pick one style over another, but in our case, we can actually combine both styles and see the benefits in it. Here we have two styles of monoidal categories in our library. The one on the left is in predicate style. It says that a category is monoidal. The one on the right is in structure style. It says it represents some underlying category U along with a proof of it being monoidal. We use different styles depending on the situation we face. We realize predicate style is better for properties about one instance of a concept, while the structure style is better for properties involving multiple instances. When we prove properties about one monoidal category, we use the predicate style monoidal. When multiple monoidal categories are involved, we use the structure style. Consider this definition of monoidal functor. The signature is the minimal we can get. We can still use the predicate style if we want to, but as you can see, the size of signature doubles. And this is really a simple case. The factor goes up quite quickly in more complex cases, so we didn't go down to this route. Besides the basic design principles, we also encountered cases where we need to pause and think if, if we're doing it correctly. One thing we realized that text cat textbook category theory is really very set theoretic. It uses languages like small, locally small, finite, etc. This kind of language, this kind of language doesn't fit well in type theory. If we force it in type theory, we are effectively assuming um, types are sets, which is quite a philosophical commitment. Therefore, we look for ways to express concepts more type theoretically. First, we want to pick some type theoretic definitions. Sometimes we speak of natural, natural isomorphisms between home sets. This is, since it's between home sets, this is clearly too set theoretic. Even in the textbook, it requires local smallness assumption. We found a way to convert this kind of Natural, uh, natural isomorphisms in, into adjunctions and mates. There are cases where we apply some set theoretic quantification on the category. For example, we might sometimes talk about finite categories. We use adjoint equivalence to replace this quantification. Let's look into how we handle these problems. 
Now let's consider adjoint functors, which are a fundamental concept in category theory. We have this signature here in Agda, which says that adjoint functors is just a relation between these two functors, L and R. Here is a textbook definition. Adjointness means that these two home sets ha have a natural isomorphism uh, between, between them. And the natural isomorphism is in this form. But if we look closer, the home functor on the left, this one maps to the home set of D. And the home functor on the right maps to the home set of C. And if we look at the signature C and D and the universe levels, the universe levels are implicitly universally quantified. So we can't relate the, their home sets directly, nor can we for the home functors. If we insist, we can use a lifting functor which lifts the which uh, by uh, which lifts the universe levels to some higher ones, so we can operate on some much larger universe. Even though it works, as we can see here, it deviates from the textbook formulation and it becomes quite ugly. Notice that this form of lifting is required in many definitions or statements, it, not just in Agda, but also in Koch. If we really want to stay with the formulation in natural isomorphisms between home satellites. So instead of this home set definition, we use this unit co-unit definition of adjoint functors. The, function, the definition goes like this. It requires two natural transformations, unit eta and co-unit epsilon, such that the triangle identity holds. And these two identities, they live in the category of functors, so the actual formulation evolved no universe level or home set. So overall, the advantage of this definition is it doesn't explicitly involve any home sets or universe levels. One lesson we learned here is to unlearn set, set theory when doing things in type theory. So now we have the definition of adjunction. The next step is to relate two adjunctions. Consider this diagram here with two adjunctions that are related by these two adjunctions, F and G, F prime and G prime, and these two natural isomorphisms expresses the adjunctions. And these two adjunctions are related by two natural transformations, alpha and beta. If this diagram commutes, we say that alpha and beta form a mate. Obviously, these definitions also involve home, setoids, home sets. So we want to replace it with something else, which is this definition. And in this definition, we replace this, this commutative diagram here with these two diagrams, small diagrams below here. And these two small diagrams are in, again, in the category of functors. So again, this definition evolved no, nothing about universe levels or home sets. Now we see we can replace some specific natural isomorphisms between home sets in a definition of adjunctions and mates. Let's see we, how we use this to replace the general kinds of natural isomorphisms between home sets by considering closed monoidal categories. A closed monoidal categories, a, a, a category is a category that is monoidal and closed at the same time. Among other laws, it is required that the monoidal functor and the inner home functor satisfy this natural isomorphism Ni. Note that all x, y, and z are natural in Ni. Now we can split this natural isomorphism into two parts, 
the adjunction part and the main part. In the adjunction part, we let the left adjoint functor like in this form and the right one in this form by requiring L and R to form an adjunction. It's the same as saying Ni is natural in X and Z. Since this adjunction exists in for all Y, if we have a morphism connecting different Ys, then we can obtain two induced natural transformations, alpha and beta, by instead of plugging Y, we plug in F. If we, if we require alpha and beta to form a mate, it's the same as saying Ni is natural in Y. Obviously now this definition of closed monoidal categories involve again, no universe level or home set and therefore it's more type theoretic is more type theory friendly. After a bit of thinking, we can see that this observation can be generalized. We can apply the same technique to the natural isomorphisms in this form. Again, we split this natural isomorphism into an adjunction part and a mate part. In the adjunction part, we require an adjunction like this. So we just leave out X and Z. By requiring this adjunction, we obtain the naturality in X and Z. For, for a morphism connecting Ys in the corresponding places and alpha and beta as the induced natural transformation, by requiring alpha and beta to form a mate, we obtain naturality in all Ys. Combining both, we completely recover these natural isomorphisms without speaking of and without speaking in any set theoretic language. So that was one type theoretic, type theory friendly technique we applied. Now let's consider a case where we need to consider finiteness of a category. In a set theoretic foundation, we will simply create a predicate like this. It says that there exists a bijection between objects and some finite set. Now this predicate is very set theoretic. By using this predicate, we then must talk about um, equality between objects. And even worse, we are assuming objects are a set, which is, a, is an unwarranted commitment. To avoid using set theoretic language directly, we use adjoint equivalence as an intermediate layer. We even think that adjoint equivalence works for other set theoretic quantifications. To give the definition precisely, an adjoint equivalence is just an, a, a, an adjunction where the unit and co-unit are nat natural isomorphisms. The observation here is that we just don't want to talk about the finiteness of any type, but if we know precisely what type we're working with, then it's okay. That motivates a very specific category, a finite diagram. You know, in a finite diagram, we, we make sure the objects and the morphisms are of finite set, which is specified as this fin type here. Since we know fin pretty well, it's even safe to think about this category set theoretically. Now we can talk about the finiteness of finite diagrams and we want to generalize it to other categories. We do this by saying a, cat by saying a category is finite if it's an adjoint equivalent to a finite diagram. This definition is not only elegant because it has no set theoretic language in it, but also well behaved with respect to limits and co-limits. We have a theorem saying that if some limit is indexed by some finite diagram, 
then the adjoint equivalence preserves it. Sure, we use adjoint equivalence here with a focus on limits and co-limits. One can still consider other notions of equivalence depending on the purpose. Here comes the end of the talk. If you're interested in our work, you can find the link here. If you want to contribute, please feel free to submit a PR. You can use this library to study category theory itself and probably do something with it. As an example, I showed simply type lambda calculus is a Cartesian closed category. It was quite easy. A lesson we learned is that some formulations work better in type theory. In particular, we prefer morphism level equalities to natural isomorphisms. We also showed how to use adjoint equivalence to express finiteness. Sure, the exploration is not finished. There is much, still much design space to consider when formalizing category theory. We don't have time to cover everything in the paper, so please feel free to check our paper for more details. That concludes our talk. Thank you very much for listening.